Friends, if you want to watch super hit movie Die Another Day in English, then you must like this video. If you are visiting our channel for the first time, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Friends, in today's video, the movie we are going to talk about is called Die Another Day. We will talk about what this movie is and where you can watch it, all the interesting facts about this movie, 
In today's video I am going to tell you. I am also going to give you all the information on which OTT platform or on which satellite channel you will get to watch this movie. Also, we will talk in detail about the technical department, music department, pre-production, filming, post-production, budget, box office collection of this film. We will also talk about the story of this film and I will also give you a small review of the story of this film. Apart from this, we will discuss about the facts of this film, storyline, star cast, actor's performance in the film and which character has played which role. That's why I request you friends to watch this video till the end, so let's start the video. Die Another Day is a 2002 spy film and the 20th film in the James Bond series produced by Ian Productions. It was directed by Lee Tamahori, produced by Michael Jeet Wilson and Barbara Broccoli, and written by Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. The fourth and final film starring Pierce Brosnan as the fictional MI6 agent James Bond, it was also the only film to feature John Cleese's Q, and the last with Samantha Bond as Miss Moneypenny. It is also the first film since Live and Let Die, 1973, not to feature Desmond Llewellyn as Q as he died three years earlier. Halle Berry co-stars as Bond Girl and NSA agent Jinx. In the film, Bond attempts to locate a traitor in British intelligence who betrayed him and a British billionaire who is later revealed to be connected to a North Korean operative who Bond seemingly killed. It is an original story, although it takes influence from Bond creator Ian Fleming's novels Moonraker, 1955, and The Man with the Golden Gun, 1965, as well as Kingsley Amos's novel, Colonel Sun. Die Another Day marked the James Bond franchise's 40th anniversary. The film includes references to each of the preceding films that IT received mixed reviews. Some critics praised Tamahori's direction, but others criticized the reliance on CGI, product placement and unoriginal plot, as well as the villain. Nevertheless, it was the highest grossing James Bond film up to that time. Movie Plot MI6 agent James Bond infiltrates a North Korean military base where Colonel Tan Sun Moon is trading weapons for African conflict diamonds. After Moon's right-hand man Zeo receives notification of Bond's real identity, Moon attempts to kill Bond and a hovercraft chase ensues, ending with Moon's craft tumbling over a waterfall. Bond is captured by North Korean soldiers and imprisoned by the colonel's father, General Moon. After 14 months of captivity and torture at the hands of the Korean People's Army, Bond is traded for Zeo in a prisoner exchange across the bridge of no return. He is sedated and taken to meet M, who informs him that his status as a 00 agent has been suspended under suspicion of having leaked information under duress to the North Koreans. Bond is convinced that he has been set up by a double agent in the British government. After escaping MI6 custody, he finds himself in Hong Kong, where he learns from Chang, a Chinese agent and old colleague, that Zeo is in Cuba. In Havana, Bond meets with NSA agent Jacinta Jinx, Johnson and follows her to a gene therapy clinic, where patients can have their appearances altered through DNA restructuring. Jinx kills Dr. Alvarez, the leader of the therapy, while Bond locates Zeo inside the clinic and fights him. Zeo escapes, leaving behind a pendant which leads Bond to a cache of conflict diamonds bearing the crest of the company owned by British billionaire Gustav Graves. Bond learns that Graves only appeared a year prior, apparently discovering a vein of diamonds in Iceland leading to his current wealth and celebrity. At Blades Club in London, Bond meets Graves along with his assistant Miranda Frost, who is also an undercover MI6 agent. After a fencing match that escalates into a Claymore duel, Graves invites Bond to Iceland for a scientific demonstration. M restores Bond's double zero status, and Q issues him an Aston Martin V12 Vanquish with active camouflage. At his ice palace in Iceland, Graves unveils a new orbital mirror satellite Icarus, which is able to focus solar energy on a small area and provide year-round sunshine for agriculture. Frost seduces Bond and Jinx infiltrates Graves' command center but is captured by Graves and Zeo. Bond rescues her and discovers that Graves is Colonel Moon, who has used the gene therapy technology to change his appearance and amassed his fortune from conflict diamonds as a cover. Bond confronts Graves, but Frost arrives to reveal herself as the traitor who betrayed him in North Korea, forcing Bond to escape from Graves' facility. He returns in his vanquish to rescue Jinx, who has been recaptured in the palace. As Graves uses Icarus to melt the ice palace, 
Zeo pursues Bond into the palace using his Jaguar XKR. Bond kills Zeo by causing an ice chandelier to fall onto him and revives Jinx after she has almost drowned. Bond and Jinx pursue Graves and Frost to the Korean Peninsula and stow away on Graves' 124 cargo plane. Graves reveals his identity to his father and the true purpose of the Icarus satellite, to cut a path through the Korean demilitarized zone with concentrated sunlight, allowing North Korean troops to invade South Korea and unite the peninsula. Horrified, General Moon rejects the plan, but Graves murders him. Bond attempts to shoot Graves, but is prevented by a soldier. In their struggle, a gunshot pierces the fuselage, causing the plane to decompress and descend rapidly. Bond and Graves engage in a fistfight, and Jinx attempts to regain control of the plane. Frost attacks Jinx, forcing her to defend herself in a sword duel. After the plane passes through the Icarus beam and is further damaged, Jinx kills Frost. Graves attempts to escape by parachute, but Bond opens the parachute, pulling Graves out of the plane and into one of its engines, disabling the Icarus beam. Bond and Jinx escape from the disintegrating plane in a helicopter from the cargo hold, with Graves' stash of diamonds. Later, they spend a romantic evening at a Buddhist temple. Cut. Pierce Brosnan as James Bond, an MI6 agent. Halle Berry as Jachinta Jinx, Johnson, an NSA agent. Before Barry's casting Salma Hayek, Saffron Burroughs, and Sophie Ellis Baxter were also considered for the role. Toby Stevens as Gustav Graves, a British entrepreneur and the alter ego of Colonel Tan Sun Moon. Graves was modeled after Hugo Drax in Ian Fleming's original Moonraker, a Nazi war criminal who switched places with a British soldier at the end of World War II, became a well-respected and wealthy philanthropist, and used this cover to plan a nuclear missile strike on London. He was also modeled after Uday Hussein and Richard Branson. Will Yun Lee as Colonel Tan Sun Moon, a rogue North Korean army colonel and the original persona of Graves. Rosamund Pike as Miranda Frost, undercover MI6 agent and double agent. Rick Yoon as Tang Ling Zeo, a North Korean terrorist working for Moon and living as an exile. Judy Dench as M, the head of MI6. John Cleese as Q, MI6 Quartermaster and Armor, Madonna as Verity, Graves and Frost's fencing instructor, Michael Madsen as Damian Falco, Jinx's superior in the NSA, Samantha Bond as Miss Moneypenny, M's secretary, Colin Salmon as Charles Robinson, M's deputy chief of staff, Kenneth Sang as General Moon, Colonel Moon's father. He assists in Bond's release back to the West. The North Korean general wishes for a peaceful reunification of Korea, whereas his son is bent on war. Michael Gorvoy as Vladimir Popov, Gustav Graves' personal scientist. Lawrence Makaware as Mr. Kill, one of Gustav Graves' henchmen. Ho Yi as the hotel manager and Chinese special agent Mr. Chung. In early drafts of the script, it was Wai Lin, Michelle Yeoh, who aided Bond in Hong Kong, but the idea fell through and Chang was created to replace her. Rachel Grant as Peaceful Fountains of Desire, a Chinese agent working for Mr. Chang, undercover as a masseuse. Emilio Echeverria as Raul, the manager of a Havana cigar factory, and a British sleeper agent. Vincent Wong as General Lee. Joaquin Martinez as elderly cigar factory worker. Simone Andrew as Dr. Alvarez. Deborah Moore, the daughter of former Bond actor Roger Moore, as airline hostess. Mark Diamond as Mr. Van Bierk. Oliver Skeet as concierge at the fencing club. Production. After the success of The World is Not Enough, producers Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson asked the director Michael Apted to return to direct. Although Apted accepted, they rescinded the offer in order to ask Tony Scott and John Woo, who both declined. Scott claims to have suggested Quentin Tarantino as director, although Wilson denies that any formal negotiations were held with him. Pierce Brosnan suggested John McTiernan, Ong Lee and Martin Scorsese as potential choices, and informally discussed the idea of directing a Bond film with Scorsese on a flight. Brett Ratner, Stephen Hopkins and Stuart Baird were later in negotiations to direct, before Lee Tamahori was hired. Principal photography of Die Another Day began on January 11, 2002 at Pinewood Studios. The film was shot primarily in the United Kingdom, Iceland and Cadiz, Spain. 
Other locations included Pinewood Studios 007 Stage and Maui, Hawaii, in December 2001. Laird Hamilton, Dave Kalama, and Derek Dorner performed the pre-title surfing scene at the surf break known as Jaws in Peahi, Maui, while the shore shots were taken near Cudiz and Nuki, Cornwall. Scenes inside Graves Diamond Mine were also filmed in Cornwall at the Eden Project. The scenes involving the Cuban locations of Havana and the fictional Isla de los Organos were filmed at La Caleta, Spain. The scenes featuring Barry in a bikini, designed to resemble Ursula Andres' swimming costume in Dr. No, were shot in Cudis. The location was cold and windy, and footage has been released of Barry wrapped in thick towels between takes to avoid catching a chill. Barry was injured during filming when debris from a smoke grenade flew into her eye. The debris was removed in a 30-minute operation. Brosnan also sustained a knee injury during the shooting of an action scene in Cornwall. Gadgets and other props from every previous Bond film and stored in Ian Productions archives appear in Q's warehouse in the London Underground. Examples include the jetpack in Thunderball and Rosa Klebb's poison-tipped shoe in From Russia With Love. Q mentions that the watch he issues Bond is your 20th, I believe, a reference to Die Another Day being the 20th Eon-produced Bond film. I in London, the Reform Club was used to shoot several places in the film, including the lobby and gallery at the Blades Club, MI6 headquarters, Buckingham Palace, Green Park and Westminster. Jokulsarlin, Iceland was used for the car chase on the ice. Four Aston Martins and four Jaguars, all converted to four-wheel drive, were used and wrecked, filming the sequence. A temporary dam was constructed at the mouth of the narrow inlet to keep the salty ocean water out and allow the lagoon to freeze. Additional chase footage was filmed at Svalbard, Norway, Jostedalsbreen National Park, Norway, and RAF Little Rissington, Gloucestershire Manston Airport in Kent was used for the scenes involving the Antonov cargo plane scenes. The scene in which Bond surfs the wave created by Icarus when Graves was attempting to kill Bond was shot on the blue screen. The waves, along with all the glaciers in the scene, are computer-generated. The hangar interior of the U.S. Air Base in South Korea, shown crowded with Chinook helicopters, was filmed at RAF Odium in Hampshire, UK, as were the helicopter interior shots during the switchblade sequence. These latter scenes, though portrayed in the air, were actually filmed entirely on the ground with the sky background being added in post-production using blue screen techniques. Although the base is portrayed in the film as a U.S. base, all the aircraft and personnel in the scene are British in real life. In the film, switchblades, one-person gliders resembling fighter jets in shape, are flown by Bond and Jinx to stealthily enter North Korea. The switchblade was based on a workable model called PSST, Programmable High Altitude Single Soldier Transport. Kinetic Aerospace Incorporated's lead designer, Jack McCorneck was impressed by director Lee Tamahori's way of conducting the switchblade scene and commented, It's brief, but realistic. The good guys get in unobserved, thanks to a fast cruise, good glide performance, and minimal radar signature. It's a wonderful promotion for the B. The satellite attack at the end of the film was at first written to take place in Manhattan, but after the September 11th attacks, it was moved to the Korean demilitarized zone. Music. The soundtrack was composed by David Arnold and released on Warner Brothers Records. He again made use of electronic rhythm elements in his score and included two of the new themes created for the world is not enough. The first, originally used as Renard's theme, is heard during the mammoth Antonov cue on the recording and is written for piano. The second new theme, used in the Christmas in Turkey track of the world is not enough, is reused in the Going Down Together track. The title song for Die Another Day was co-written and co-produced by Mirwesa Midzai and performed by Madonna, who also had a cameo in the film as Verity, a fencing instructor. The concept of the title sequence is to represent Bond trying to survive 14 months of torture at the hands of the North Koreans. Critics' opinions of the song were sharply divided, it was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Original Song and the 2004 Grammy Award for Best Dance Recording, but also for a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Original Song of 2002, while Madonna herself won the Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Supporting Actress for her cameo. In a Maury poll for the Channel 4 program James Bond's Greatest Hits, the song was voted 9th out of 22, 
and also came in as an overwhelming number one favorite among those under the age of 24. Marketing. Reportedly, 20 companies paying $70 million had their products featured in the film, a record at the time, although USA Today reported that number to be as high as $100 million. The 11th generation Ford Thunderbird was featured in the film as Jinx's car, with a coral color paying homage to a paint option for the original model, and matching her bikini. Ford produced a limited edition 007 branded 2003 Thunderbird as a tie-in for the film, featuring a similar paint job. Revlon produced 007 color collection, makeup inspired by Jinx. Bond Barbie dolls inspired by the franchise were also produced, featuring a red shawl and an evening dress designed by Lindy Hemming, and sold in a gift set with Ken posing as Bond informal wear designed by the Italian fashion house Brioni. Release. Die Another Day had its world premiere on November 18, 2002 at the 56th Royal Film Performance a fundraising event held in aid of the film and TV charity. The event took place at the Royal Albert Hall in London and Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip were guests of honor. The Royal Albert Hall had a makeover for the screening and had been transformed into an ice palace. Proceeds from the premiere, about 500,000 pounds, were donated to the film and television charity, of which the Queen was patron. Die Another Day was controversial in the Korean Peninsula. The North Korean government disliked the portrayal of their state as brutal and war-hungry. The South Koreans boycotted 145 theaters where it was released on December 31, 2002, as they were offended by the scene in which an American officer issues orders to the South Korean army in the defense of their homeland, and by a lovemaking scene near a statue of the Buddha. The Jogi Buddhist order issued a statement that the film was disrespectful to our religion and does not reflect our values and ethics. The Washington Post reported growing resentment in the nation towards the United States. An official of the South Korean Ministry of Culture and Tourism said that Die Another Day was the wrong film at the wrong time. Home Media Die Another Day was released on DVD and VHS on 3 June 2003, IT was released on Blu-ray on October 21, 2008. It was released digital in 4K on September 15, 2015. Reception On the first day of release, ticket sales reached £1.2 million at the UK box office, Die Another Day grossed $47 million on its opening weekend in the US and Canada and was ranked number one at the box office. The film would compete against Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and the Santa Claus 2 during the Thanksgiving weekend. Moreover, all three films were able to defeat the underperforming animated film Treasure Planet. Later on, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and Die Another Day would simultaneously reclaim the number one spot at the box office for six months. They were both the latest films to return to the top spot at the box office. Until Finding Nemo joined the group in June 2003, the film earned $160.9 million in the US and Canada, and $431.9 million worldwide, becoming the sixth highest grossing film of 2002. Not adjusting for inflation, Die Another Day was the highest grossing James Bond film until the release of the next James Bond movie, Casino Royale, in 2006. Critical Response On Rotten Tomatoes, the film received an approval rating of 56% based on 220 reviews, with an average rating of June 1st 10. The site's critical consensus reads, Its action may be a bit too over the top for some, but Die Another Day is lavishly crafted and succeeds in evoking classic Bond themes from the franchise's earlier installments. On Metacritic, the film has a weighted average score of 56 out of 100 based on 43 critics, indicating mixed and average reviews, Audiences surveyed by CinemaScore gave the film a grade A- on scale of A to F. Michael Dekina of Film Threat praised the film as the best of the series to star Pierce Brosnan and the most satisfying installment of the franchise in recent memory. Larry Carroll of CountingDown.com praised Lee Tamahori for having magnificently balanced the film so that it keeps true to the Bond legend, makes reference to the classic films that preceded it, but also injects a new zest to it all. Entertainment Weekly magazine also gave a positive reaction, saying that Tomahori, a true filmmaker, has re-established the series' pop sensuality. 
A.O. Scott of the New York Times called the film the best of the James Bond series since the spy who loved mean Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times, who gave the film three stars out of four, stated, This movie has the usual impossible stunts, but it has just as many scenes that are lean and tough enough to fit in any modern action movie. Kyle Bell of Movie Freaks 365 stated in his review that the first half of Die Another Day is classic Bond but that things start to go downhill when the Ice Palace gets introduced. Several reviewers felt the film relied too heavily on gadgets and special effects, with the plot being neglected. James Berardinelli of Real Views said, This is a train wreck of an action film, a stupefying attempt by the filmmakers to force-feed James Bond into the mindless XXX mold and throw 40 years of cinematic history down the toilet in favor of bright flashes and loud bangs. Of the action sequences, he said, Die Another Day is an exercise in loud explosions and excruciatingly bad special effects. The CGI work in this movie is an order of magnitude worse than anything I have seen in a major motion picture. Coupled with lousy production design, Die Another Day looks like it was done on the cheap. Gary Brown of the Houston Community Newspapers also described the weak point of the film as the seemingly non-stop action sequences and loud explosions that appear to take center stage while the Bond character is almost relegated to second string. Roger Moore, who played Bond in earlier films, said, I thought it just went too far, and that's for me, the first Bond in space. Invisible cars and dodgy CGI footage? Please. The amount of product placement in Die Another Day had been a contemporaneous point of criticism, with the BBC, Time and Reuters referring mockingly to the film using the title, By Another Day, the producers subsequently chose to limit the number of companies involved in product placement to eight for the next Bond film, Casino Royale, in 2006. Retrospective Despite favor from fans who prefer Bond's more camped films, a comment piece in 2020 stated that it is considered by many to be the worst entry in James Bond's canon and compares unfavorably to The Bourne Identity, released months earlier, which ushered in a new era of violent, gritty action espionage movies and gave rise to the stripped-down, no-nonsense Bond of Daniel Craig. It often occupies a low rank on Bond-related lists. In a 2021 Yahoo survey consisting of 2,200 experts and superfans, Die Another Day was ranked as the third worst installment after Quantum of Solace and Spectre. The authors of the study did, however, specify that every Bond film is always someone's favorite. Media Die Another Day was novelized by the then-official James Bond writer, Raymond Benson, based on the screenplay by Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. An effort is made to depict some of the film's more outlandish elements with more believability, in the style of Fleming's original novel's use of cutting-edge technology. So, for example, the non-bodywork elements of the Aston Martin with its cloaking function, the glass windows and rubber tires, are described as having retractable covers to achieve the invisibility effect. Fan reaction to it was above average. After its publication, Benson retired as the official James Bond novelist, a new series featuring the secret agent's adventures as a teenager, by Charlie Hickson, was launched in 2005. As the novelization was published after Benson's final original 007 novel, The Man with the Red Tattoo, it was the final literary work featuring Bond as originally conceived by Ian Fleming until the publication of Devil May Care by Sebastian Fox in 2008 to mark the 100th anniversary of Fleming's birth. 007 Legends, released in 2012, features Daniel Craig's James Bond in a Die Another Day level. Speculation arose in 2003 of a spin-off film concentrating on Jinx, which was scheduled for a November-December 2004 release. It was originally reported that MGM was keen to set up a film series that would be a Winter Olympics alternative to the main series. In the late 1990s, MGM had originally considered developing a spin-off film based on Michelle Yeoh's character, Wai Lin, in 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies. The spin-off Jinx was announced in December 2002. Lee Tamahori initially wanted to direct, but Stephen Frears was ultimately hired. Barry and Michael Madsen were originally going to reprise their roles as Jinx and Falco, while Jinx's lover was going to be played by Javier Bardem. Bardem would later play villain Raul Silva in Skyfall, 2012. The film would have revolved around Jinx's entry into the NSA, 
revealing that she had been adopted by Falco after being orphaned in a bombing and being hired by him from the RAND Corporation to do a job at the NSA as a favor. Wade described the film as a very atmospheric, Euro-thriller, a Bourne-type movie. However, despite much speculation of an imminent movie, on October 26, 2003, Variety reported that MGM had cancelled the project that MGM instead decided to reboot the James Bond franchise with the next film, Casino Royale, with Daniel Craig portraying the role of the titular character. In 2020, Barry revealed that the film was cancelled over its $80 million budget, saying, Nobody was ready to sink that kind of money into a black female action star. Purvis and Wade said that this decision was influenced by the failure of several action films with female stars, including Charlie's Angels, Full Throttle and Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, in 2003. Die Another Day Movie Review I realized with a smile, 15 minutes into the new James Bond movie, that I had unconsciously accepted Pierce Brosnan as Bond without thinking about Sean Connery, Roger Moore or anyone else. He has become the landlord, not the tenant. Handsome if a little weary, the edges of an Irish accent curling around the edges of the Queen's English, he plays a preposterous character but does not seem preposterous playing him. Die Another Day is the 20th Bond film in 40 years, not counting Casino Royale. Midway through it, Bond's boss M tells him, while you were away, the world changed. She refers to the months he spent imprisoned at the hands of North Korean torturers, but she might also be referring to the world of Bondian thrillers. This movie has the usual impossible stunts, as when Bond surfs down the face of a glacier being melted by a laser beam from space. But it has just as many scenes that are lean and tough enough to fit in any modern action movie. It also has a heroine who benefits from 40 years of progress in the way we view women. When Halle Berry, as Jinx, first appears in the movie there is a deliberate and loving tribute to the first Bond girl, Ursula Andress, in Dr. No, 1962. In both movies, the woman emerges from the surf wearing a bikini which, in slow motion, seems to be playing catch-up. Even the wide belt is the same. But Jinx is a new kind of Bond girl. She still likes naughty double entendres, Bond says, my friends call me James Bond and she replies, well that's a mouthful. But in Die Another Day her character is not simply decoration or reward, but a competent and deadly agent who turns the movie at times into almost a buddy picture. The film opens with an unusual touch, the villains are not fantastical fictions, but real. The North Koreans have for the time being joined the Nazis as reliable villains, and Bond infiltrates in order to, I dunno, deal with some African conflict diamonds, if I heard correctly, but I wasn't listening carefully because the diamonds are only the MacGuffin. They do, however, decorate the memorable cheekbones of one of the villains, Zeo, Rikyun, who seems to have skidded face down through a field of them at high impact. A chase scene involving hover tanks in a minefield is somewhat clumsy, the hover tank not being the most graceful of vehicles, and then Bond is captured and tortured for months. He's freed in a prisoner exchange only to find that M. Judy Dench, suspects him of having been brainwashed. Is he another Manchurian candidate? Eventually he proves himself and after a visit to Q, John Cleese, for a new supply of gadgets, including an invisible car, he's back into action in the usual series of sensational stunt sequences. For the first time in the Bond series, a computer-generated sequence joins the traditional use of stunt men and trick photography. A disintegrating plane in a closing scene is pretty clearly all made of ones and zeros, but by then we've seen too many amazing sights to quibble. The North Koreans are allied with Gustav Graves, Toby Stevens, a standard-issue world-dominating Bond villain, whose orbiting space mirror is not exactly original. What is original is Gustav's decision to house his operation in a vast ice building in Iceland, since his mirror operates to focus heat on the Earth. This seems like asking for trouble, and indeed before long the ice palace is melting down, and Jinx is trapped in a locked room with the water level rising toward the ceiling. Exactly why the room itself doesn't melt is a question countless readers will no doubt answer for me. Other characters include the deadly Miranda Frost, Rosamund Pike, whose name is a hint as to which side she is on, and Damien Falco, Michael Madsen, whose name unites two villainous movie dynasties and leaves me looking forward to Freddie Lecter. Oh, and Miss Moneypenny, Samantha Bond, 
who seems to have been overlooked, makes a last-minute appearance and virtually seduces Bond. The film has been directed by Lee Tamahori, whose credits include Once Were Warriors and Mulholland Falls, from New Zealand, who has tilted the balance away from humor and toward pure action. With Austin Powers breathing down the neck of the franchise, he told Sight and Sound magazine, it seemed like looking for trouble to broaden the traditional farcical elements. Die Another Day is still utterly absurd from one end to the other, of course, but in a slightly more understated way. And so it goes, bond after bond, as the most durable series in movie history heads for the half-century. There is no reason to believe this franchise will ever die. I suppose that is a blessing. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. 1999's The World Is Not Enough was a James Bond film that seemed oddly unenthused and lazy, relying on old franchise traditions without any real sense of spark or effort. The next Bond feature, 2002's Die Another Day, almost seems its opposite. If anything there is too much effort taken to shake things up, I applaud its ambitions while finding the results absolutely farcical. For those who struggle with remembering which Bond film is which, this is the one with the invisible car. In Die Another Day, Bond, Pierce Brosnan, is captured and tortured by the North Korean military after a mission goes awry. Released in a prisoner exchange he goes rogue to track down the Korean terrorist Zeo, Rick Yoon, encountering his American equivalent Jinx, Halle Berry, along the way. The Bond films have regularly pushed the limits on realism in regards to the various gadgets Bond receives from his quartermaster cute branch, as well as some of the more outlandish master plans unleashed by his enemies. Occasionally those limits are broken completely, most famously in 1979's Moonraker but also very much here in Die Another Day. Here everyone appears to own a deadly laser. Gene therapy treatments can change a person's entire height, appearance, and ethnicity. The villain has a giant satellite that can reflect and amplify the sun's rays, effectively creating a death beam that incinerates everything in its path. And yes, James Bond has an invisible car. Die Another Day's first and most significant problem is that there is no suspension of disbelief. It is simply so outlandish and unbelievable that it becomes difficult to care about the story. There is also an odd obsession with giving Bond more inventive and unusual things to do. He enters North Korea on a surfboard. To escape the villainous Gustav Graves, Toby Stevens, destructive Icarus Ray he improvises some parasailing. In the middle of the film there is an utterly odd fencing duel between them. They all feel vaguely ridiculous, like a balding middle-aged man driving an incongruous sports car. It all jars very badly with the film's opening act, in which Bond is brutally tortured for 14 months in a Pyongyang prison. The film pushes heavily into giving Bond an equal as a love interest. Jinx, Barry, is not just another international secret agent. She is overtly and aggressively sexualized, comes packed with her own range of pithy quips and Bond mows, and enters the film pursuing her own agenda. The problem with the character comes with balance. This is, at the end of the day, a James Bond film. Bond needs to dominate, and this soon drives Jinx into the same victim-cum-sidekick role occupied by all Bond girls. It is the same problem faced by Y. Lin, Michelle Yeoh, in Tomorrow Never Dies. Sooner or later the apparent equal female protagonist is going to be tossed the proverbial idiot ball to make the genre conventions work. The sexual innuendos, a key part of Bond in its earlier decades, continue on from their revival in the world is not enough, but here they seem massively expanded. It seems everyone is in on the act, not just Bond but Jinx, M, fellow MI6 agent Miranda Frost, Rosamund Pike, Graves, even Madonna has a red-hot go in an odd one-scene cameo. I actually feel a little sorry for Pike. Future performances in Gone Girl, A Private War, and other films will show her off as one of the UK's strongest acting talents. Here she plays demure second fiddle to Halle Berry, until, spoiler warning here I suppose, an under-motivated second act twist reveals her as another villain. For the rest of the film she is stuck playing things overt and hammy. One wonders if, at the point she is required to challenge Barry to a sword duel on a Russian cargo plane while wearing nothing but tight pants and a sports bra, if Pike reconsidered playing the role, even her life choices. If there is a highlight of the film, it is Bond and Zeo engaging in a one-on-one -on -one duel while driving gadget-filled spy cars on a frozen lake. 
That, however, is one scene, and does not explain where Zeo got a spy car and fails to compensate for the weird silly science fiction elements, or the unbalanced characters, or the risible dialogue, or Toby Stevens' oddly awful performance. In his mild defense, he knows what he's in and performs appropriately, this is a villain performance in the mode of Jeremy Irons' spectacular self-sabotage in Dungeons and Dragons. Running a decades-long action movie series is always going to be difficult. Keeping things at a constant standard of quality must be close to impossible. It is no surprise that there are bad Bond films as much as there are good ones, and there are some absolutely great ones. Casino Royale, from Russia with Love, The Spy Who Loved Me. You probably have your own top picks. I would be flabbergasted if Die Another Day makes your list. This is Bond at its silliest, and it's most catastrophically awful. Other information about this film. Widely regarded as one of the worst Bond films, it's easy to understand why. Die Another Day has many flaws but it's not without entertainment value. I think the first 30 minutes are classic Bond and the opening action scene with the hovercraft is imaginative and nicely executed. I like all the stuff in Cuba and hell, even the Ice Palace doesn't bother me that much. It is Bond after all and that's what it's all about. David Arnold's score has the Bond theme in it on several occasions and his action cues remain some of the best in the business. It has the great brass section necessary for any decent Bond score and it works well for the film. Pierce Brosnan was a great Bond, where he could be charming, funny and still ruthless at the same time. Rick Yoon as Zeo was a really cool villain and is always worth watching. The CGI, dear god the CGI is arguably the worst of all time especially in the parasurfing scene. I remember in the cinema I actually felt myself going red at how bad it was. How could anyone create that and think, yeah, that looks good. There are several bad pieces of CGI throughout the movie, but there's just an overload in the second half. It's not just the effects though, this movie is dumb, even considering it's a Bond movie it's dumb. There's an invisible car. Halle Berry looks great but her character is crap and has terrible lines like, your mama. The villain Gustav Graves is more annoying than threatening and just comes across as a smug git. The fact that he is actually the Korean general from the opening scene is beyond silly. You can stretch suspension of disbelief up to a point but this really pushes it. What's so annoying about the film is the fact that it could have been great. The opening credits with Bond being tortured was amazing looking but only let down by Madonna's awful song. The story itself had the potential to be interesting but after the first 30 minutes it's totally pissed away by awful CGI and just utter stupidity. Overall, Die Another Day has a few things going for it in the first half and the music is great, but it's just so dumb with irredeemable special effects that it's hard to recommend. 2002's Die Another Day is the first time we see 007 in a post-9-11 world. While this movie was released about 14 months after the attack, Pierce Brosnan's fourth and final turn as Bond only hints at the serious world we were living in at the time. The rest of movie comes across as a bonkers Roger Moore style of Bond flick, mixed with popular action movies of the late 90s and early 2000s. When I saw this in the theater and witnessed the first ever CGI bullet being shot at an audience during the gun barrel sequence, I knew this was going to be a Bond flick that stood out. The first half of the film is the best Brosnan Bond movie since Goldeneye. The second half? Less said the better. Bond's coolest moment? Walking into that Hong Kong hotel lobby, not caring how he looks. This could be from any classic Bond movie. Bond's most embarrassing moment? Bond kitesurfing away from an avalanche slash tidal wave is one of the most embarrassing moments in the entire franchise. Brosnan looked like the only live-action character in an Ice Age or Happy Feet animated film. Bond's best line? Bond's, I've missed your sparkling personality, followed right by Zeo punching him in the stomach and saying, how's that for a punchline? Best acting performance? Rosamund Pike as Frost is terrific in her limited role. You can see the future Oscar nominee has some real talent. Bond's most sexual predator moment? Not much to choose from, so I will go with Bond tricking Frost into making out for longer, as if Graves' goons were still spying on them. Worst line in the movie? Yo mama, should never be uttered in a Bond film. I hope Halley didn't improvise that. What I noticed for the first time after watching this for the 89th time. 14 months after September 11th. Bond held captive for 14 months. 
M saying the world changed while Bond was away. All connected. Best action sequence? I really enjoy the sword fight at the Blades Club. It seems so out of place in a Bond movie, but it's well choreographed and it never disappoints when I see it. Who or what is the title song about? Your guess is as good as mine. I'm guessing it has to do with Bond's survival mentality. But why the hell is Madonna singing Sigmund Freud? Analyze this, analyze this, analyze this? Best looking cinematic moment? Like I mentioned before, the Jaguar vs Aston Martin car chase on a frozen lake in Iceland is beautiful to watch, even if the action is ridiculous. How could the villain have succeeded? By not faking his own death. He could have done his entire plan from North Korea. He would still have to kill his father I guess. Which other Bond actor could have starred in this movie? I guess an in his prime Roger Moore makes sense, but this really is perfect for Pierce. He always tried to be a hybrid of Sean and Roger, and you can see it in this movie. Does Bond ever think he might die? Before the prison exchange with Zeo, Bond knows he is about to be shot by the North Korean firing squad. Brosnan does a good job of portraying Bonds, so this is how it ends, facial expression. What would have made the movie better? Cut the entire kitesurfing escape and the plain action climax. The movie is too silly for a movie 2 hours and 10 minutes long. What's in a name? Bond takes the name and sunglasses of diamond smuggler Van Beerk. Notice how Bond is also already dressed like him before taking his identity. What's in a title? Die Another Day is one of a handful of Bond titles that has no connection to Ian Fleming or anything related to Bond history. It's the third and final in the Brosnan Bond soap opera's title-sounding flicks, Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, Die Another Day. Drinking Game Take a sip of your mojito every time a character utters a bad pun. This movie has more bad puns and one-liners than the three previous Brosnan Bond flicks. Hashtag pun another day. WTF? Moment. Bond has the superpower to fake a heart attack. How did he learn this trick? Why did he ever learn how to do this? Fun fact. Pierce Brosnan suffered a knee injury during the pre-title action sequence, which prompted the production to stop shooting for seven days. Overall ranking. 20th Best Bond Movie Out of 25 Bond Movies Review Synopsis This is the 20th official James Bond movie and it came out on the 40th anniversary of Dr. No. They tried to throw everything but the kitchen sink here. The tone shifts, the IRL-worthy puns, the embarrassing CGI and an invisible car didn't give Pierce Brosnan a proper send-off as Bond. In fact, this movie, despite it being a huge box office hit, made producers re-examine the franchise. This led to the much-needed Daniel Craig era. With all that said, Die Another Day is still highly entertaining in the same ways A View to A Kill and Diamonds Are Forever Are. More details. Madonna goes to her local salon to get her roots done but it's shut. I guess I'll die another day, she sighs. And that awful gag is better than the lyrics to her stunningly contentious 007 theme. Wordsmiths like Don Black and Anthony Newley crafted Diamonds of Bond themes, multifaceted gems which linger forever in the mind. Sigmund Freud. Analyze this. It doesn't have a lot to do with Bond, does it? In fact, I wonder if Madge had seen any of Dad or any Bond movie when she crafted that dance floor oddity. But let's not linger on such matters. Instead, let's consider Pierce Brosnan's final turn as 007, a movie which at times feels more like a sci-fi film than a Bond flick. It opens with Bond surfing to work, which seems exhausting and rather odd. He's on a mission. Colonel Tan Sun Moon is illegally trading weapons for African conflict diamonds, so Bond tries to stop him. That segues into a not-bad hovercraft chase, also a first for the franchise. I don't remember anyone craving such a chase in 2002, but it was different if nothing else. James's mission is scuppered when he is betrayed. Bond is captured by the enemy, and during those opening titles he is tortured, grows a big bushy beard, puts on weight, and loses the ability to button up his shirt. Eventually, after 14 months, our hero is traded and goes through a detox in a high-tech lab. Naturally M, Judy Dench, is miffed with him, because that's her default setting with Bond. As a side note, a doctor is played by Paul Darrow, the much-missed Blake 7 star. Just a shame he's barely in the movie. 007 escapes from MI6 custody, swims a vast distance, 
apparently, not that we see any of it because the camera cuts to him emerging from the drink, and checks into a Hong Kong hotel without buttoning his shirt up. 14 months of imprisonment will do that to an agent. Eventually Bond gets a tip-off that he needs to go to Cuba, actually Cadiz, where I spent a wonderful day a couple of years ago just because of this movie. The big bad this time is Toby Stevens's Gustav Graves, a super annoying businessman who free falls to a press conference while the clash's London calling sets my teeth on edge. Not because it's a bad track, but because it's the default tune for film and ad makers who want to inject some energy into a London-based scene. Graves is like a cross between 1990's Richard Branson and one of those annoying apprentice contestants who spits out sound bites like, sleep is for wimps, and incurs the wrath of Alan Sugar on day one. Bond crosses paths with Jinx, Halle Berry, an NSA agent who emerges from the Cuban surf like Ursula Andress in Dr. No and relishes a double entendre. As Bond has the libido on an 18-year-old, it's mere moments before he and Jinx are steaming up the lens like rampant honeymooners. However, as this is 007, he also beds MI6 agent Miranda Frost, Rosamund Pike, who winds up at an impressive ice palace and, spoiler alert, turns out to be the obligatory femme fatale. John Cleese returns for his second and final turn as Q, and he's rather excellent as Gadget Dispenser. Just a shame the invisible car is so laughable. The tech is perfectly fine. Stick a load of cameras reflecting what they see on the hull of anything and it sort of becomes invisible. Sort of. But this being Bond, it's tech from 50 years in the future. Madonna pops up in a cameo as a fencing instructor, and remarkably isn't dreadful. There's a rather good dueling scene between Graves and Bond, but sadly very little rapier-like wit. The script throughout is good, not great. As this was released to mark the 40th anniversary year of 007, the movie is littered with nods to the franchise, including some of the props from years gone by. Anyway, Graves shows off his ice palace and his orbiting weapon Icarus, a solar-powered laser capable of mass destruction. It's a shame that Die Another Day features one of the best action scenes of the saga, a car chase across a glacier, and easily the worst. The moment when Bond paraglides against a CG backdrop is one of those when you wonder what the reaction was at Ian Productions. I'm guessing it was like that scene in This Is Spinal Tap when a model of Stonehenge is believed to be a mock-up of a stage set, and turns out to be the actual prop because Nigel Tufnell couldn't get his measurements right. The CG scene in Dad looks like an animatic, one of those animated storyboards that gives filmmakers an idea of how the final scene will look. Except this IS the finished scene. And it looks atrocious, like a cut scene from a video game circa 1992. For the most part, Dad looks fabulous. If you ignore the CG atrocities, Halle Berry's dive off a cliff is awful, though she and Ms. Pike are superb, and there's a great fight on a plane reminiscent of that stunning finale in The Living Daylights. Michael Madsen turns up as American official Damien Falco, but looks like he's wandered in from another movie and has absolutely nothing to do. And Rick Yoon's Zeo is an okay villain, who could have been a character from a Paul Simon song. People say he's crazy, he's got diamonds embedded in his face. That finale on a plane is straight out of a comic book as Graves, aka Colonel Moon, clashes with Bond while wearing a high-tech suit. There's a fine comical scene when Moneypenny, Samantha Bond in her final 007 movie, finally gets to kiss Bond, but it's all a VR gag. And it's that devotion to effects which really lets the side down. The physical stunts are what made Bond great over the years. Real people risking life and limb to bring that magic to screen, whether it's the ski jump slash parachute moment from Spy Who Loved Me, or the damn jump from Goldeneye. Nobody ever gasped because Pierce was obviously hanging around in front of a green screen. James Bond is sent to investigate in North Korea which does not begin well for him as he is captured and kept as a prisoner. After he casually surfed into the country. Uh, really? The first time we get to see James Bond with long hair? Okay, already I'm trying to think of some positives to mention about this truly awful film. Well that didn't last very long trying to be nice about it as let's face it this is not going to be a very nice review. Although I must say that since going through the Bond films as part of the Bondathon, I have been warned well since starting that this film is a bad one. Thanks to my lovely Twitter slash blogger friends. I was even told to not bother watching all of the film.
Well I managed to persist with it which believe me was not an easy task. The only thing that this film has made easy is where it the ranks in the 24. A post about that will be up in a few days I promise. Anyway I don't even know where to start with the plot as it was pretty crazy from the start with a lot of crazy characters. I like that Bond has always had cheeky little lines that relate to sex and they never overdid it. Quite often the last line and would make you smile wondering if anyone didn't quite get it. This film went and spoiled all of that hard work, as every 15 minutes, guesstimate, we had a sex reference. We even had a couple of doubles, which really wasn't needed that just makes me think that the writers had actually ran out of good things for the characters to say so resorted to trying to get some laughs instead. John Cleese has now taken over as Q and the gadgets take its silliest turn yet. Honestly you have to see it to believe it, pun intended, as they reveal the car turns invisible to the naked eye. Yes 007 now has an invisible car, so he has such a cool supercar and they decide to make it invisible? Well I guess that isn't the biggest problem with the idea of this. Unfortunately an invisible car isn't the worst thing about this film, which is saying a lot. As well as doing the theme song, Wrong in Itself, Madonna also had a small role in the film, I really could not believe that at all. It began a truly awful fighting scene in a fencing club, again I am being totally serious. I am now going to stop mentioning things that happened in the film as if you have no seen it you will think I am making it all up. I wish I was making some of this up. Halle Berry was truly awful, honestly I have never seen her put in a good performance, haven't seen Monsters Ball so please forgive me, this was even worse than Catwoman. Okay I might just be getting carried away now. I also had no clue Rosamund Pike existed before the last few years, surely her role in this film hurt her career for a little while. Nice to see her doing well now though. I am also now shocked that Brosnan actually had the nerve to badmouth Spectre. Someone should make him watch this rubbish again. Extra information. The 2002 movie, Die Another Day, marked several milestones in the James Bond franchise. 1. It was released during the 40th anniversary of the cinematic Bond which began with 1962, Dr. N.O. 2. It was the first time that a non-white actress portrayed the leading lady in a Bond film. And 3. It happened to be Pierce Brosnan's last Bond film for EON Productions, at the moment. Die Another Day starts out with a mission in which Bond has to kill a North Korean army officer named Colonel Moon, who has been illegally selling military weaponry in exchange for African conflict diamonds. Betrayed by a MI-6 mole, Bond is swept up in a chase and shootout that results with Colonel Moon being killed by Bond before falling over a waterfall. In a departure from the usual Bond formula, the agent ends up captured Colonel Moon's father and the North Korean military. He spends the next 14 months being tortured for information, disavowed by his superiors upon his release, and his status as double zero agent suspended by M, Bond sets out to find the mole on his own. He eventually uncovers evidence that overtakes his personal vendetta, and M restores his double zero status and offers MI6 assistance to help him uncover what he has found. Bond's search eventually leads to billionaire businessman Gustav Graves, who is actually Colonel Moon surgically altered via gene therapy. Graves slash Moon has been collecting African conflict diamonds for an orbital mirror system that uses the diamonds as a source of solar energy for a small area to light the Arctic nights and, if the investment goes well with buyers, provide year-round sunshine for crop development. In truth, the orbital mirror system is actually a super weapon to be used to clear a path through the minefield in the demilitarized zone that separates North Korea from South Korea. Needless to say, Bond discovers the MI6 mole who had betrayed him and with the help of American NSA agent, Jinx Johnson, destroys Graves slash Moon's weapon and the latter's scheme. Since the release of the latest Bond film, 2000 SIXS Casino Royale, a harsh backlash against Brosnan's tenure as James Bond and especially, Dad in particularly has grown considerably. In fact, Dad is now regarded as the worst Bond movie in the franchise's history. Personally, I do not agree with this harsh assessment. I do not consider Dad to be a masterpiece or even among the better Bond films. But I certainly do not view it as the disaster that many are claiming it to be. I can honestly say that my assessment of Dad has improved slightly after my last viewing. Pierce Brosnan had to wait three years after 1999's The World Is Not Enough to portray James Bond for what turned out to be the last time so far.
I do not think I would consider his performance in Die Another Dage to be amongst his finest. Yes, he had some very good moments in the film that were featured in the following scenes. But I did have problems with certain aspects of his performance, especially his second meeting with M inside one of the London underground tunnels and some of the sexual innuendos that he was forced to spout. In fact, that second scene with M left me with an uncomfortable feeling that dramatic angst might not be Brosnan's forte. And I find this ironic, given his superb performance in an old 1980 TV miniseries called The Manians of America. Perhaps he simply was not up to par during the days when he shot that particular scene. Ewan Productions seemed to have better luck with the movie's leading lady, Hollywood superstar, Halle Berry. Many fans felt it was improper for her to co-star in a Bond film, viewing her as a bigger star than Brosnan. I do not know if I agree with this assessment. Both Honor Blackman, Goldfinger, and Diana Rigg, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, were already well-known thanks to the successful TV series, The Avengers, when they shot their respective Bond films. So, I cannot really see the harm in Barry following in their footsteps. She portrayed Jochington to Jinx, Johnson, a NSA agent investigating the whereabouts of one of the villain's henchmen, Zeo. Her investigation leads to a sexy encounter with Bond in Cuba and eventually a showdown with Graves and Miranda Frost in Korea. Due to her current unpopularity with Bond fans, many of them view Barry as the worst Bond girl ever. But I have no idea. Perhaps in some way, she does not fit their image of what a Bond girl should be. Personally, I thought that Barry gave an excellent performance, despite some of the bad sexual innuendos that she was forced to spout. In fact, I really enjoyed Barry's take on the competent, yet humorous and very sly Jinx. She made the character a fun person to know, and she performed her action sequences in a competent manner. Granted, I did not feel impressed by Barry's homage to Ursula Andress' watery entrance in Dr. N.O., but I was never that impressed by Andress' little moment, either. Although I would never list Barry among my top 5 Bond ladies, I would certainly list her in my top 10. Probably at number 6. British actor, Toby Stevens portrayed Gustav Graves, a billionaire with sinister ties to North Korean agent Zeo, a DNA gene therapy machine and a supply of African conflict diamonds that provide energy to a new destructive weapon called Icarus. Graves turns out to be the same Colonel Moon with whom Bond had clashed, and allegedly killed, in the movie's pre-title sequence. Stevens had the double task of portraying a credible villain against Brosnan's Bond and recapturing Will Yun Lee's performance as Colonel Moon during Graves' private moments. Personally, I felt that Stevens did a pretty good job. Not only did he manage to portray Gustav Graves' overblown persona, he also succeeded in recapturing Lee's portrayal of the scheming and arrogant Moon, who also longs for his father's approval. Unfortunately, being 16 years younger than Brosnan, there were times I felt that Steven seemed too young to be considered as an equal adversary for Bond. And quite frankly, some of his dialogue seemed overblown, even when Moon was not doing his Gustav Graves impersonation. MI6 Agent Miranda Frost turns out to be the mole who initially turns Bond's life upside down by betraying his mission to Moon and the North Koreans. Rosamund Pike gives a subtle performance as the treacherous Frost, who seemed to blow hot and cold toward the sexually interested Bond. Her performance, in fact, strongly reminds me of American actress Grace Kelly's performance in the Hitchcock film, T.O. Catch a Thief. However, I did have problems with Pike's love scenes with Brosnan. She seemed to come off as a little too breathless and fake. Perhaps that breathless quality was meant to be an indication of Frost's fake or real adair for Bond. If so, I feel that Pike may have overplayed her scene a little bit. Sophie Marceau did a more subtle and superior job in The World Is Not Enough. And like Brosnan, Barry and Stevens, Pike had to endure spouting some bad dialogue. Rick Yoon portrayed Zeo, Graves slash Moon's right-hand man, who is wanted for terrorist acts by the Americans and the Chinese. He is the very Zeo who is exchanged by the Americans and the British for Bond at the North slash South Korea border. Aside from his imposing presence, I did not find anything particularly unique about Yoon's performance. All I can say is that he did a competent job. On the other hand, I found myself being very impressed by Will Yoon Lee's performance as Gustav Graves' alter ego, Colonel Moon. 
Like Toby Stevens, he did a beautiful job in capturing Moon's arrogance, impatience and great need to impress Daddy. And speaking of Moon's father, namely General Moon, it seemed a pity that the latter did not turn out to be Bond's main adversary. Kenneth Sang portrayed the North Korean general as an intimidating and intelligent man that no one would want to trifle with. Even Bond seemed to feel the presence of his forceful personality after a joke failed to make any impact. I must commend Sang on an impressive performance. Judy Dench returned as M. In Die Another Day. By this time, she had made the role of MISIXS director as her own. But I must say that I did not find anything unique about her performance in this movie. John Cleese went from Q's assistant to the quartermaster in his second appearance in the Bond franchise. And if I must be honest, I enjoyed Cleese's performance very much. Unlike his role in Twine, he did not ruin his character's sharp wit with ridiculous slapstick. I realize that I am about to commit an act of sacrilege, but I found myself preferring Cleese's Q to the one created by the role's original actor, the late Desmond Llewellyn. Do not get me wrong. I thought that Llewellyn did a great job but I simply preferred Cleese's more acid take on the role. Colin Salmon returned as M's assistant, Charles Robinson. I liked the guy, but I barely noticed him in this movie. I did notice Michael Mastin's performance as Jinx's NSA boss, Damien Falco. Who could help but notice? The Falco character came off as an aggressive blowhard. It seemed a shame that I found Mastin's performance appalling, considering his reputation for portraying his past characters with more subtlety. I can only assume that he was forced to adhere to the Bond franchise's cliché of the ugly American. And finally, there is Samantha Bond as Moneypenny. Poor woman. Poor, poor woman. I disliked her sexual innuendo-spewing performance in Tomorrow Never Dies. But I had to wince through that embarrassing sequence that featured Moneypenny's holographic dream of being seduced by Bond. Personally, I feel that Ms. Bond managed to reach the nadir of her tenure as Moneypenny in that scene. I think that it seemed fitting that Die Another Day marked the Bond franchise's 40th anniversary. In many ways, the 2002 movie reminded me of its 40-year counterpart, 1962, Dr. No. The older movie featured Sean Connery's first performance as Bond. Die Another Day featured Brosnan's last. Both movies featured the first appearance of the leading ladies, emerging from the water. Both featured Asian or part Asian villains. And both seemed to be hampered by what I feel were schizophrenic plots and production styles. Actually, that is the main problem I had with Die Another Day. Like Dr. N.O., its story was presented in a manner in which the first half seemed more like a spy thriller and the second half, a fantasy adventure reminiscent of Bond movies like Goldfinger, you only live twice, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. And instead of the two styles blending seamlessly into a solid movie, Dad nearly became a schizophrenic mess. I enjoyed the first half very much. Bond's capture by the North Koreans, his and Zeos exchange and the search for the MI6 mole who had betrayed him felt like a genuine spy thriller, well, except for that ludicrous moment in which Bond appeared in the lobby of a Hong Kong hotel. Unfortunately, screenwriters Neil Purvis and Robert Wade really screwed up the movie's second half in two ways. They had Q present Bond with that invisible Aston Martin, which still makes me wince, and they sent him to Iceland and that ridiculous ice hotel. Even worse, they subjected fans to that ludicrous ice duel between Bond, in the Aston Martin, and Zeo, in a Jaguar XKR. The second half also featured the uninspiring fight between Bond and Graves slash Moon aboard a military transport over Korea. The only scenes that truly made the movie's second half worthwhile were the tense scene that featured Miranda Frost's revelation as the mole and her deadly fight with Jinx aboard the transport. Lee Tamahori, Mulholland Falls and Along Came a Spider, directed Die Another Day. I thought that his direction was not that bad but I suspect that he may have been hampered by Purvis and Wade's schizophrenic script, especially the movie's second half. Speaking of the script, I think I may have already said a lot about it. On second thought, perhaps not. For example, the dialogue. Yes, the movie had a some good lines, but like Dr. No, it pretty much sucked. To be more specific, the dialogue containing sexual innuendos pretty much sucked but that seemed to be the case in most of Brosnan's 007 films. 
If indeed seemed annoyingly peppered with bad innuendos, Dad seemed to choke on them. I truly felt sorry for Brosnan, Barry and Pike who had to spew them every now and then. Cinematographer David Tattersall had beautifully captured the exotic color of Cuba and London's elegance. But that is as far as my admiration can go. I simply could not drum up any excitement over the Korea and Iceland sequences. Madonna sang the movie's title song, penned by Madonna and Mirway Samadzer, and made a cameo appearance as a fencing master named Verity. Many fans raised a fuss over her contributions to the movie. Frankly, I found their fuss a waste of time and Madonna's contributions, both the song and the cameo, rather mediocre. On the whole, I disagree with the prevailing view that Die Another Day was the Bond franchise's worst movie or one of the worst. Frankly, I have seen worse Bond films. In fact, I have a slightly better view of Dad than I do of the movie it was supposed to be celebrating, namely Dr. No. But it seemed a shame that Brosnan's last Bond film had to be one of sheer mediocrity. There is no denying it, Die Another Day is the worst James Bond film in the official franchise. The World Is Not Enough was released to cheer from critics and fans with some feeling that Denise Richards was a misstep in an otherwise solid entry. Going into the 40th anniversary, producers obviously felt the pressure to deliver something bigger, something people would love. Die Another Day would not only be released on the 40th anniversary of the James Bond franchise, but would also be the 20th Bond entry. Two grand titles which clearly meant an unimaginable amount of pressure weighing down on producers, and cast and crew as a whole. The game needed to be upped with no stone left unturned. In same ways Die Another Day succeeded. In most ways it failed on many many levels leaving the franchise in disarray post Born and Triple X. After seeing Once Were Warriors, producers knew they had found their director. Lee Tamahori came onto the film a few months into the script writing process. Script writers, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, were attached from the beginning penning various outlines and drafts before finally settling on the finished product. A few new ideas were introduced and further rewrites, common for big-budget films, took place. The usual two-year production cycle was thrown out the door in favor of releasing on the 40th anniversary of the franchise, which is fine as it gave production the extra time needed to accommodate for a grander concept. The plan was to go bigger and be better than any previous entry. Paying homage to the film's previous was something everyone was consciously aware of, and upon watching Die Another Day multiple times this month, you can see every Bond film has been referenced, sometimes in major ways cough diamonds are forever cough. BMW had been the main James Bond vehicle since Pierce Brosnan took over the 007 position, but with the contract up, Aston Martin was quick to return to the series with the release of the V12 Vanquish, or as Q Branch calls it, The Vanish. A move that had fans cheering for the return, but left everyone perplexed when seeing it on the big screen. Which I guess is how the film felt. If you've erased this outline from your memory, I'm here to bring it all back in horrifying detail, and for that I'm truly sorry. James Bond is on a mission in North Korea illegally trading diamonds for military-grade weapons. When his cover is blown, Colonel Moon is chased away by Bond in an interesting hovercraft chase across a minefield. Bond manages to kill him, but is captured by Moon's father, General Moon, and tortured for the next 14 months. During that time, no body or muscle mass is lost, nor is his training which never seems to falter throughout his mission. After being traded back for Zeo, Colonel Moon's henchman, Bond goes on a personal mission to clear his name and track down Zeo who has now escaped and is dealing in diamonds belonging to Gustav Graves. Along his journey, Bond meets NSA agent, Jinx, and gets all the usual gadgets including an invisible car from the new Q. Of course after his capture and release, Bond isn't working for MI6 anymore, not officially anyway. M is trusting of Bond still and tasks him with finding Zeo and following his hunch on Graves. A brief and deadly encounter with Gustav lands him an invitation to Iceland where Gustav is showcasing his Icarus satellite. Bond is greeted in Iceland by Mr. Kill and we find out Miranda Frost, Gustav's PA, is an undercover MI6 agent. In Iceland at the Ice Palace, Jinx and Bond figure out that Gustav Graves is none other than Colonel Moon who had used gene therapy to not only change his DNA, accent, height and fighting skills, but also use the diamonds to build a giant satellite he plans to use to destroy anyone that stands in his way. 
Of course, Bond is there to ruin those plans and Jinx is there to ruin the film as the bad guys go down while Bond lives to die another day, deep breath. But not as the same actor or character because following this lump of shit the producers and fans decided this type of Bond could no longer go on and a serious change was needed to make this franchise great again in the face of new challengers like Bourne, all done. Did I mention Madonna makes a cameo as a fencing instructor? Or that Bond jumps the shark by jumping ice? Or that an invisible car almost completely throws all concepts of believability out the window? Or that a CGI bullet is included in the gun barrel sequence? Holy crap, die another day broke me. I thought tomorrow never dies was bad. I thought Denise Richards was joke casting. I thought real stunts with real actors in situations that were a little out there was as far as the Bond franchise would go. But no. Die Another Day sees the line set by the spy who loved me in Moonraker, drives over that line and keeps on going while using the invisible car to make another lap we can't even see or hear. I've heard interviews with the screenwriters Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, and they genuinely appear to be big James Bond fans. They know the novels, the films and most of all they seem to respect the source material. But these two guys also gave us a script with Jinx. The material here is subpar with a somewhat interesting story being used for what appears to be a celebration of 40 years 007. Bond's capture and torture hasn't been done before and starts the film off in an interesting enough way. The tone of the film is usually set from the pre-credit sequence, and as the credits roll and we see 007 held by North Koreans, you're expecting a film which plays on the formula quite drastically. That's not the case. Bond is set free after 14 months with a fake beard and long hair but zero loss of weight or PTSD. As a matter of fact, there are zero repercussions to his health throughout the entire film. Even the world is not enough showed Bond being injured on duty and carrying that throughout, but not here. Brosnan is back as Superman, and producers don't want you forgetting that. So Neil Purvis and Robert Wade get a tiny pass from me. Barely though. I mean the dialogue throughout is still bad. The major issues have to sit on others. Producers Barbara and Michael need to answer for this abysmal product and the fact they actually wanted to get Sean Connery to play 007's father. An actor who has played Bond in the past to return to the franchise to play a character who is dead as mentioned in Goldeneye. Clearly they never acted on these impulses, nor watched their own films, but the thought alone sends shivers up my spine. To make matters worse, they chose a director best known for Once Were Warriors, which in itself is fine, but the director knows nothing about handling a big-budget franchise such as Bond. Apparently it was his idea to have the invisible car and wanted the gun barrel to include a bullet. An actual bullet. But it's not needed. Doesn't help the film. Doesn't do anything but set the tone for this nightmare of an anniversary flick. Anyone else could have done a much better job at directing than Lee Tamahori. His use of slow motion takes me right out of the action and has these strange and utterly pointless ways of showing the landscape by speeding the footage up and landing on a single moving vehicle. Oh I just hate it. Nothing about him on this franchise is good. Lee even went to the effort of trying to have the Bond is a code name theory put into this film which would have allowed him to show or mention other Bond actors. Uh, just no. Bond is not a code name passed onto the 007 agent. So take that idea and toss it out the window along with this film. People try to use that theory as a means of explaining the different actors and timeline, just face it. Bond is a film franchise and has been around since the 60s. We don't need to try to explain it all. I don't care that Spider-Man is in his mid to late 20s yet has been around since the 60s. I just deal with it and don't think too much. And clearly Lee Tamahori was loved for some reason and had a bit of say, but thankfully not enough. He can't direct action and barely handles the other moments without trying to show off. Not a fan at all. And as a director, I can sorely blame him for the absolute worst casting in Bond history, Halle Berry as Jinx. I have no idea at all what the hell anybody was thinking when it came to the character of Jinx. I'll always be a Jinx to you. I think I got the thrust of it. Wow, now there's a mouth full. What the hell type of lines are these? What the hell? Seriously what happened to the James Bond franchise when it was all of a sudden decided that 007 needed a sidekick? Worse than that, why is that sidekick Jinx? Even worse, 
Why is she given such a vast amount of screen time and all the sexual pun dialogue and shown as an arse-kicking female with her own agency behind her and gadgets? Oh wait a moment. That's right, Jinx was going to be given a spin-off. While doing the press rounds, producers were clearly trying to push the Jinx spin-off movie as hard as possible. I remember going into this film thinking Halle Berry was okay in X-Men, got her tits out in Swordfish, and had a sex scene in Monster's Ball, she must be right for a Bond film. How very wrong I was, and how very wrong was the marketing for pushing her so hard down our throats that I wanted to violently throw up when watching Die Another Day this month. Multiple times. I'm past the point of playing nice with these producers. James Bond has always successfully been reinvented and updated with the times. But with Die Another Day, it painfully comes across like a non-James Bond film, and I put the blame on producers. They have been in control of the franchise and know what makes a Bond film good and Halle Berry is not a good fit. She's undeniably sexy, but that does nothing to help a horrible performance in the film. This review is already running long, and if you've managed to stick around and find something worthwhile, I thank you. This film directed by Lee Tamahori, written by Neil Purvis, Robert Wood, produced by Michael G. Wilson, Barbara Broccoli, starring Pierce Brosnan, Halle Berry, Toby Stevens, Rosamund Pike, Rickum, John Cleese, Judy Dench, Cinematography, David Tattersall, Edited by Christian Wagner, Music by David Arnold, Production Companies, Metro Goldwyn Mayer Pictures, United Artists, Ian Productions, Distributed by MGM Distribution Company, 20th Century Fox, Release Dates, November 20, 2002 in United Kingdom. November 22, 2002 in United States. Running time. 133 minutes. Countries. United Kingdom. United States. Language. English. Budget. $142 million. Box office. $431.9 million. So guys, this is the review of Die Another Day movie and some information about it. How do you like our today's video, please let us know by commenting and if you like this video, please like it, share it and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.